Um, this session's a bit of a mixture, and I'm going to um, add to the mixture by talking about some something completely different. I, I don't. Um, I'm not going to say much about HIV because I don't know very much about HIV. But what I'm going to do is talk, um, tell a fairly simple story about asthma, and um, at the end draw some sweeping conclusions about NCDs in general and um, how they relate to what we've been hearing about HIV. What's the global burden of asthma? We can estimate this from a study I helped organise called the International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood, which now involves about 300 centres around the world. And what this has shown is there's a big variation around the world, ranging from about 30% in uh, high-income countries down to about 3% in low- and middle-income countries. Asthma doesn't really feature much in global NCD debates because it doesn't kill many people, so, and the priority is in preventing mortality. And also most of the risk factors that we're focusing on, like um, alcohol and um, diet and exercise and even tobacco, actually don't have much um, influence on asthma causation. But it's a potentially important disease because if we think about what the burden's going to be in 20 years' time, as the world gets more Western, we're seeing this slow epidemic of asthma sweeping across the world. We don't know what's causing it, but as countries get more, more Westernised, they get more asthma. So we're looking at the possibility that in 20 years' time, um, most low- and middle-income countries will have 30% of children with current asthma symptoms. So it's something that doesn't feature in the current global NCD debates, but is potentially very important. What can we do to prevent it? Almost nothing. Um, you probably think that uh, asthma is caused by dust mites or cats or um, smoking or air pollution. In fact, I've spent 20 years studying asthma and the main thing I've achieved has been to show that actually none of those things are important primary causes of asthma. If you have the disease, they set off attacks, so they're secondary causes, but there's very little evidence that they're important primary causes and we still don't know what the primary causes are. So we can do very little to prevent it. However, we can do a lot to manage it. And I'll tell one story from some work I did in New Zealand. I got involved 20 or more years ago. Uh, this is me on the right here um, some years ago. Um, <laughs> and um, I got involved in this thing called the Māori Asthma Review, which was set up to study the problem of asthma in, in Māori. And the prevalence is basically the same in Māori and Pākehā, European New Zealanders. But there are big differences and exacerbations, which are mostly about access to health care and asthma education. And one of the things people called for was a very simple asthma self-management plan. And the group I was working with had one. Um, we printed it on a, an essentially a credit card-sized piece of plastic. Today we would have a cell phone app, um, but a uh, piece of plastic in your wallet works fine too. Um, and what we did... We did the study um, in uh, a very poor Māori community in New Zealand. It was before and after, um, but over a short time period. We had a simple self-management plan. We did the same. Um, this was the group of community workers we did the study with. Um, we also did the same study in Tonga. There we, we did before and after, but we were going to have a control island as well. But there was a hurricane which sort of messed up that part of the study. So both of them are before and after. But basically, people got better, and it's very, it's very simple. The plan is not magic. All it does is get people taking their medicine properly. So they, it gets them taking their inhaled steroids properly. You can manage asthma with very cheap generic drugs. All you need is basically salbutamol and some sort of cheap inhaled steroid. And if people take those properly, that mostly solves the problem of asthma management. And so we had um, big improvements in peak flow rates. Um, people woke less at night. Um, there were fewer hospital admissions, fewer emergency visits, and so on. And also, we did qualitative research. And what was striking about it was that people actually started to change their behavior. And the key thing was that what many people said was that for the first time in their life, they realized they could do something about their health, that it wasn't normal to be waking every night, that actually by following the plan, by following the steps, by talking to the doctor when they needed to, they didn't have to live like that. And it helped them realise that they could change other things too. So a lot of people gave up smoking, a lot of members of their family gave up smoking, a lot of things changed. Why did this work? Um, well, in fact, before we did this study, um, the consensus was that self-management plans don't work. There have been lots of studies, including some in the UK, generally showing they don't work. 
And the reason is that doctors would hand them out, spend five minutes explaining them, and people wouldn't follow them. What was different about this um, study was the people. It was the community health workers. And we actually employed them because we needed people to keep daily diaries. But in terms of seeing every people every week or so to collect their diaries, they would also reinforce the management plan. There's a, um old Māori saying, which is, um, he aha te mea nui, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, which is, what is the most important thing? It's people. And it was actually the people that made this work. Um, so what do we need to do to make this happen globally? We need three things. Um, we need access to cheap generic asthma medications. We need improvements in asthma management, and we need people. It's, um, and as part of the ISAAC study, the International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood, two, two and a half years ago, I hosted a meeting here to set up something called the Global Asthma Network. And what that does is bring together the work of ISAAC, which has 300 centres worldwide, and the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, which has, um, has a number of centres worldwide and has done a large amount of work to improve asthma management globally. So what we've done is set up a network with um, friendly clinicians and community workers, plus the facilities of IUATLD. Um, we have an asthma drug facility which is uh, uh, arranging access to cheap generic asthma medications and also we're working to improve management to, um, so that people use the medications properly. One striking thing about this is that it's been very hard to get funding and the funding is always under threat and, and it's particularly under threat at the moment because it doesn't fit any of those bullet point WHO priorities. It doesn't address mortality. This is about dallies, it's not about mortality. Um, it comes under respiratory disease, but the focus has been on COPD. And it's about treatment, not about prevention. But in terms of asthma, and in terms of doing something about the global epidemic which is coming, this is one of the most effective things that we can do. So I said I'd finish with some sweeping conclusions. So here they are, and you can um, disagree with me. Um, <laughs> The first thing is that treatment is, and I think this is a lesson from HIV, that treatment is a prerequisite and co-requisite for prevention. That if you, now it's clear with HIV that if, you, um, if you're not offering treatment, people are not going to get tested, they're not going to come in, it's very hard to do prevention. And of course, if they do get treatment, as we've just seen, that's an important stage in prevention as well. But it's also true in NCDs that um, if you provide treatment and establish contact with people, then, um, then they change their behaviour. The second thing, um, and this came through very strongly in the study we did in, in the very poor Māori community, was that the key thing is the community health workers. And what most patients with a chronic disease need is a friend in the health system. And the reason that things go wrong is because they don't have a friend in the health system. They don't have the right person to go to. They die because they fall through the cracks. I'll, um, I'll tell you one story, if I've got time, which is um, the main community health worker we work with in this Maori asthma study. I'll call her Carol. Um, wonderful person. They had a contract for asthma. They had one for suicide prevention. They had one for cervical screening. So they had contract for those three rather different things. They weren't allowed to do anything else because they weren't contracted for it. <laughs> but they did amazing work. And um, I kept up contact for many years, and I'd go to the family gatherings and so on. And then Carol got diabetes, and she got some bad treatment. She lost communication with the hospital. She got sick. And um, me and one of the other doctors working in the project were trying to arrange someone alternative, someone different she could go to. And um, she kept saying, uh, no, no, I'm fine, don't worry about me. And we'd say, no, no, we're coming to see you on Saturday. And she'd say, no, no, we're fine. And um, so then I'd arrange that we go the next week when I got the phone call that Carol had died. And it really brought it home to me that that's why people die from these chronic diseases. They're pointless, stupid deaths because of lack of communication between the different parts of the system because of people working in silos and because the different levels don't communicate between primary care and secondary and tertiary care. And what you need is someone to link that up. In New Zealand, for example, if you have a chronic disease and you um, have some sort of um, 
uh, benefit from the government. They assign you a case manager which makes, who makes sure that you go and get treatment, you turn up for appointments because you're going to lose your benefit if you don't, and they get you sorted out. But the average patient with a chronic disease doesn't have that and they fall through the cracks. And that happens in rich countries like New Zealand and the UK, and it happens even more in low and middle income countries. So basically everyone needs a case manager. It doesn't have to be a GP, it could be a practice nurse, community health worker, general community worker, or it could be someone on the end of a cell phone. Um, but they need one person who's responsible for making sure they don't fall th through the cracks. And what they also need is an integrated approach to primary health care because they don't want one person for their asthma and one person for their diabetes. They want one person for their, for their NCDs. For various reasons, HIV-positive patients have received part of that, and we saw some examples this morning. Essentially, they're all examples of choosing a high-risk group, which is HIV-positive people, and providing either integrated primary care or parts of integrated primary care. Um, I agree with um, Ian Roberts. I not, don't think he's... Now he's said his piece, I think he's gone. But um, I, I think the fact that targeting worked for HIV doesn't mean that it works in general. And um, what we... It's fair enough to have priorities, provided they're within the context of a, of a more comprehensive approach. But I agree with him that just taking HIV and adding on one more disease is, is really not the solution. We need some sort of integrated approach to primary care. And for various reasons, HIV patients have been a priority group in some low and middle income countries for receiving that sort of um, service. And that this may provide a model for providing primary health care for NCDs more generally. Thank you.